Coming up on AgWeek TV, drought continues to worsen across the region, but some help is on the way. I'm Michelle Rook. The drought continues to expand in South Dakota. We'll have a reaction coming up. On the Soil Health Minute, we'll talk about the research NDSU is doing to fit cover crops into corn. It's a big job handling giant horses like the Budweiser Clydesdales. We'll meet the team behind it as they travel throughout the country. Welcome to Ag Week TV, I'm Shauna Olson. Some harvest crews are in northeastern North Dakota this weekend, ready to bring drought relief to ranchers in the west central part of the state. The USDA has approved emergency haying and grazing on some CRP acres as devastating drought continues through parts of the Dakotas and Montana. James Hohalter, a state conservation and livestock specialist with the USDA's FSA office in Fargo, says they've freed up nearly a million and a half acres in North Dakota for haying and grazing. Landowners have a couple of options. Under emergency haying, the participants uh, bear no cost for that. It's free to the participant to put that hay up. However, that hay cannot then be sold. It can be donated to a livestock producer or used for their own livestock, but it cannot be sold. Under the managed haying provisions, there is a 25% reduction to the annual rental payment for the CRP participant, and they can still donate it if they want to, but they can also sell it to someone in need as well. Forage prices have gone up significantly over the past several months. If you have any questions, you can call the North Dakota Drought Hotline number on your screen. The drought continues to spread and intensify in South Dakota as well. While the release of CRP acres and the Livestock Forage Program will help ranchers, more assistance will be needed as crop and pasture conditions continue to deteriorate. Michelle Rook talked to farmers and officials at the recent South Dakota Governor's Ag Summit. The latest U.S. drought monitor shows the drought is expanding here in South Dakota, and that's a concern for grain and livestock producers as well as government officials. Currently, nearly all the state is in some level of drought. All the, the four categories now shown in South Dakota, all of them expanded in area. Uh, the worst being the D3 uh, extreme drought area. Lieutenant Governor Matt Michaels says the drought task force has been activated, but more assistance is needed. We have various soft spots and working with our, our farm lenders and other people to get them through uh, you know, these downtimes. Cattle producers have been hit hard. With pastures drying up early, many were forced to cull their herds. Pasture conditions in Brown County, western Brown County, are, you know, we reduced our stocking rates. We've seen a lot of pairs uh, go to town. USDA has released CRP for emergency haying and grazing, but farmers also bailed wheat for hay, with much of the crop a disaster. Between spring wheat and winter wheat, uh, give or take around 50% of both of those crops have been uh, harvested for hay. Corn has also been hurt with the hot, dry conditions during pollination, and even soybeans have gone dormant. We're really going to be keeping an eye on things real close the next few weeks, um, but we might not see the real impacts, you know, till August or sometime later. For state officials, their concern is the impact on the economy and losing individual operations. Hopefully we can figure out ways that uh, our producers can hang on to what they have left, um, get through this year, and hopefully we can get some moisture and, and things can rebound next year. In Aberdeen, I'm Michelle Work reporting for Ag Week. This week's NAS report shows crop conditions down again, with spring wheat at only 8% good to excellent, corn at 28% good to excellent, and soybeans at 25% good to excellent. Anheuser-Busch recently gathered as many local barley growers as they could at the malting plant in Moorhead to say thank you. The company offered up some of the latest in technology and research in beer development. We don't have good beer without good barley, and, and the North Dakota growers are very important for that. Dr. Joshua Butler is a barley breeder with Anheuser-Busch based in Colorado. The goal is to develop new barley varieties for Budweiser beer. So we're all working on Fusarium head blight too. It's a big problem. It produces a toxin that we don't want in our barley. So we're, there's also a lot of federal initiatives and research that's going on revolving around that too. He says the future of barley is a full transition into two row from six row. There's some advantages to two row. Uh, one is that does have higher extract. Two, it's believed that there's higher yield potential in two rows. And 
Finally, there is a generally lower protein content. Josh Gackle farms near Cullum, North Dakota. He says two-row barley has gone over well on his operation. He came to Grower Days to learn more about the crop. Part of it is seeing all these other growers. I mean, that's been really beneficial is to visit with people from other parts of the state who are growing barley, but maybe different varieties. Joachim Wiersma is a University of Minnesota agronomist who focuses on barley. He's working on a public study to develop a hardy winter barley variety. Barley acres have been dwindling since the 70s. It is more and more difficult for the large brewers and even the microbrewers to source adequate barley of right, the right quality to feed the malt houses and the brew houses. And so it's a way to get into more acres because now we can go further south with the barley. But he says it will be about 20 years before a winter variety is ready for this region. The Budweiser Clydesdales were a highlight of the Grower Days event. We'll have more on how that team of horses travels the nation later in the show. Coming up on Ag Week TV, ag auctions are going high tech. We'll take you to the new auction center of North America. My name is Joel Kaler, owner operator of Kaler Farms in Lidgewood, North Dakota. We make a patented product called the Cornstalk Guide. It's made out of UHMW, ultra high molecular weight poly, which is extremely durable. Typically what you'll see on corn heads is the idler chain in the sprocket sticks out. We attach to the side of a snout. Our product will keep all the wear off the snout and get it to come into the head smoother without bouncing. Celebrate 175 years of Case IH equipment heritage with a limited edition Case skid steer or compact track loader painted with the same red paint of the venerable Case IH farm equipment line. Only 175 are being built and they're going fast. Built to the same specifications on the same assembly line as the award-winning regular Case models, these machines are a working piece of history. Get yours before they're all gone. Hurry into your local Titan Machinery location or go to www.red175.com to learn more today. Keep your pickup box organized with Delta Storage Solutions from Home of Economy. Our Delta toolboxes keep your gear safe and dry while maximizing storage. Then add on a Delta fuel tank. It integrates seamlessly with our Delta toolboxes to save you space. And Home of Economy's got your tank accessories, fill right transfer pumps, Baldwin fuel filters, and the region's largest selection of hoses and nozzles. Get your pickup box storage solutions today at the guaranteed lowest price. Home of Economy, where your dollar buys more. I'm one pony, I'm 30, I'm 30, I'm 55, I'm once around the block, 212, five right here, now I'm having tons up. If you're thinking about selling a piece of land or you're looking to sell some farm equipment or if you're thinking about a retirement or involved in an estate, give us a call. We'll sit down and tell you all about the Steffes way. We think it's a good way. That's how we approach it. If any of those are in your plans, give us a call or go to steffesgroup.com. Learn all about us. Hope to hear from you. Introducing the new Challenger 1000 series, tractors unlike any other manufactured by Agco. Redefining what a wheel tractor is capable of when it comes to wheel slip, power to ground, and fuel economy. Today, it's not enough just to be tough. You've got to be smarter than everyone else, too. Contact your Challenger dealer today to get in the seat of the new Challenger 1000. Superior engineering, superior performance, superior productivity. The next generation of tractors from your Challenger dealer. Maybe you've seen it along I-94 near Bismarck. The new Pfeiffer's Auction Center of North America opened this month. Ag Week's Jenny Schlecht was at the first auction and shows you how Pfeiffer's is taking auctions to the next level. This is the first auction at the new Auction Center of North America. It's the usual mix of construction and farm equipment. But unlike most auctions, buyers don't follow the auctioneer from item to item. They watch the action on a screen. President Kevin Pfeiffer is proud of its state-of-the-art technology in his new auction center. The technology here is absolutely incredible. You can be anywhere within this facility and watch the auction. So you can be in any of the offices or the conference room or the reception area out in the auction hall and you can watch the auction and it's all broadcast live here you can be on site bidding and it's all being broadcast simultaneously on the internet so anybody all over the world can bid at the same time as anybody on site 
Piper says about 20% of their buyers are online. The technology makes it more convenient for buyers around the world and gives sellers a competitive advantage. A lot of buyers today, they live busy lives, they're either working hard and they're spending time with their families. They don't, might not have time always to travel to an auction. So buyers like the convenience of internet bidding. You're exponentially building that bidder pool that much more for your seller. So it's a great uh, competitive advantage when an auction company provides that avenue for selling and marketing their product on the internet. Pfeiffer says they wanted to be centrally located in North Dakota, close to Bismarck, but an easy drive from South Dakota or Manitoba. He found the perfect spot along I-94. Really for the auction center of North America, this is probably about the best spot you could find. Pfeiffer says if you're driving by, stop in for a look. In Steele, North Dakota, this is Jenny Schlecht for Ag Week. For more information, visit Pfeiffer's.com. The Blue Flint Ethanol Plant in Underwood, North Dakota is celebrating its 10th anniversary. Jeff Zuger is CEO of Midwest Ag Energy, which owns the plant. It started production in 2007. It produces 70 million gallons a year using steam generated from an electrical plant next door. Zuger says the plant helped build corn production for farmers in the region. When we first talked about building an ethanol plant in an area that traditionally isn't known for corn production, we kind of thought, well, this could be a challenge for us, but we knew that we had a viable source of energy in the unusable steam at Coal Creek Station, which was the foundation for our early business. And then as we built the facility, corn genetics continued to improve, and egg producers in the area really took hold of growing corn in this area and expanded corn production. John Weida, a former director of Great River Energy, helped start the plant. He says it's especially remarkable because it opened during a downtime in the industry. I think the biggest question mark was the volatility of the ethanol industry. At the time we were doing the planning, it was a very profitable industry. But as Murphy's Law would have it, when we went into production, it was one of the harder times financially for the industry. But as you go into a, a project like this, you have to realize it's a commodity. Things will go up, things will go down. You just have to make sure that you're sound in your business plan so you can carry through the poor times and cash in on the good times. Midwest Ag Energy also opened Dakota Spirit Ethanol in Spiritwood, North Dakota in 2015. Coming up on Ag Week TV, learn about what NDSU is doing in this cornfield to fit cover crops in rotation. But first, is the drought in the Dakotas improving? Your agri weather forecast is next. Mayo Manufacturing, your Red River Valley source for Batco. Mayo Manufacturing, your Red River Valley Batco dealer. Martinson Ag Risk Management offers a variety of crop marketing and crop insurance packages to our customers. With over 40 years of experience, our dedicated staff works hard to ensure you get the best advice on crop insurance, marketing, and risk management. Contact Randy or any of the staff at Martinson Ag Risk Management today at 701-205-4200 or visit us online at martinsonag.com. This is Dennis Belisky. If you're trying to save a little money this summer but still need to make a major purchase before harvest, check out resourceauction.com. Our August 1st auction is chock full of good units that will sell to the highest bidder. Our suppliers have made the decision to liquidate equipment, and this is without a doubt the region's premier summer consignment event. Hundreds of units from 2010 and up with many tractors, trucks, and combines. Check it out at resourceauction.com, and we'll see you on August 1st. Advanced Biofuel for America's diesel engines is clean burning and made from renewable sources like soybean oil. Biodiesel fuel works in any diesel engine, reducing emissions, helping us breathe cleaner air. Biodiesel adds value to North Dakota soybeans, creating jobs, improving the environment, increasing our energy independence. Biodiesel, it starts with soybeans, it's fueling America. My name is Joel Kaler. 
owner operator of Kaler Farms in Lidgewood, North Dakota. We make a patented product called a cornstalk guide. It helps guide corn stalks into the grabs in the chains a lot smoother without losing corn. The corn stalk, when it comes off of our product, it's already on the gathering chain instead of being able to hit that idler. Our product will keep all the wear off the snout and get it to come into the head smoother without bouncing. Weather portion of Ag Week now. Summer is moving along. It's up virtually getting into be harvest season in some parts of the northern plains. Uh, maybe a little bit too late for some crops. But row crops, certainly the eastern Dakotas down through Iowa, western Minnesota, still plenty of time. We are hitting a dry spell in the forecast. The big question is how long will that last? Will it be a few days? or will it be half of the month of August? One good thing, at least the short-term setup this weekend and into the early part of the week, it will not be as hot as it has been during some of the warm spells during July. And there are some distant storm chances. Keyword there is chance. I want to talk about the monsoon. We don't think about monsoon here in the Northern Plains, but there actually is one. Southwest moisture comes up out of the Gulf of Baja this time of year, July and August. By the time it's crossed all the mountains though, the low level moisture has been raining out and we're left here in the northern plains with an area of moisture when the winds come out of the west southwest generally about 10,000 feet and up now the present situation is we've had a northerly surface wind and so it's not very humid at the surface but if we get a few days of wind blowing up out of the midwest with moisture in it we'll have a very saturated atmosphere but for the time being it's not that good now there is a weather system i think will drop in out of the north around midweek and i do think that will present an opportunity for some scattered thunderstorms just like it's been being though i suspect these will end up being widely scattered and it's really just i think a one day shot like a, maybe a day and a half, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Wednesday, Thursday, as those storms move through. Meanwhile, troughiness in the eastern U.S. likely ensures more rain for parts of the Corn Belt and the southeastern states look stormy. That monsoon moisture will make for some mountain storms in the west, but that's it, just mountain storms. The hottest weather relative to average will be over the Rocky Mountains. We'll stay warm in the northern plains. Little blips of cool in the northeast to start off the month of August, but I do suspect they'll eventually warm up in the east. So there's a little bit of a pattern shift going here. By the end of the week, it will be quite warm in the west, not as hot here in the middle of the country, and a little bit cool on the eastern side. But as we go into that August 6th to 12th week, the second week, I think there's going to be a little bit of troughiness in the jet stream that may result in an opportunity of waves coming out of the southwest and a bit of a return of humidity into the Plain States. In that situation, watch what will likely happen. Chance for some storms that might might lead to several days of stormy weather. It's a little bit iffy, but it's a pattern that bears watching. If this trough digs deeply enough, if the waves are strong enough, there could be some second week of August uh, significant rains into the northern plains. We'll rely on that because until then it's going to be relatively dry. Not a lot of super hot weather, but a lot of warm weather. Hotter weather back toward Montana and those distant storm chances. Week and a half or so away. We'll hang on to that. Hi, everybody. It's the Washington County Fair, Wednesday, August 2nd through Sunday, August 6th in Lake Elmo. Enjoy free live music with Boogie Wonderland Friday night and the Rockin' Hollywood Saturday night. Hundreds of animals, including free pig races, truck pull Thursday night, autocross Friday night, and demolition derby Saturday night. Daily carnival ride specials and, of course, all the delicious food. Adults only $7, young adults $4, and kids 5 and under are free. Plus free parking. It's the Washington County Fair, Wednesday, August 2nd through Sunday, August 6th in Lake Elmo. Field Drainage Inc. has perfected the art of agricultural drainage by helping hundreds of farmers since 1978. We are a second generation family owned business for over 35 years. The Field Drainage Inc. team will work closely with you to conduct a thorough analysis of your needs and expectations. Provide an estimate that fits your budget, perform all work in a timely and professional manner, and provide continued service after installation. Field Drainage Inc., your trusted drain tile installation company for over 35 years. Located in the heart of the Red River Valley, Bloomfield Enterprises sells the finest trailers in the business. Family owned and operated since 1997, Bloomfield Enterprises prides themselves on carrying a wide variety of trailers for customers to choose from. With Bloomfield Enterprises, you can be assured that customer service is more than just a phrase. With a full service shop and repair center, we are committed to take care of our customers even after the sale. Whether you're in the market for a new trailer or good quality farm equipment, we have just what you're looking for. Call today or visit us online at bloomfieldtrailers.com. 
For over 40 years, Northside Implement has been your Gell and Vermeer dealer in Webster, South Dakota and Lidgerwood, North Dakota. With new equipment including feeding, grain handling, haying, and skid steer, as well as a nice selection of used equipment including sprayers, spreaders, seating, as well as tractors and loaders. Northside Implement stands behind the equipment they sell with quality service guaranteed. See us for all your repairs and parts, from tillage to skid steer loaders to combines and everything in between. Contact Dave, Lydell, Tom, or Chris today at Northside Implement or visit our website for our complete equipment listing. Where do you go for the latest news in agriculture? AgWeek Magazine. Reaching over 30,000 farmers and ranchers in North Dakota, Minnesota, South Dakota, and Montana. AgWeek provides the most up-to-date information on the markets, the trends, and the people who make it all happen. We're your source for news, not fluff. Dependable. Trusted. AgWeek. Subscribe today by calling 1-800-811-2580. The Ag Week Soil Health Minute is sponsored by the North Dakota Corn Council and the North Dakota Soybean Council. Interseeding cover crops into corn is a current focus of NDSU research and extension. In this Soil Health Minute, Abby Wick shows us one component being studied within a USDA project. We're down here in Rutland, North Dakota at a project where Dave Franzen and I, along with several other colleagues at NDSU, are looking at interseeding cover crops into corn. In these fields, we have cereal rye, camelina, and radish interseeded into corn at five to eight leaf. And our goal in doing that is to get cover crops established so when the corn is harvested, those cover crops already are growing, they're there, and they're ready to take off. One of the common concerns of interseeding a cover crop into corn is that that cover crop will compete for water and nutrient resources. So I wanna show you what the cover crops look like within the corn rows, and then here where we've taken out the corn and let the cover crop grow. So within the corn rows, we have actually, this is the size of the radish that was interseeded in the corn rows. When we get out here to the cover crops that, that haven't been limited by shade, you can see that the growth is much greater and that those cover crops are much larger. When I see these two side by side, the radish from within the corn row and the radish outside the corn rows, you can see that the, that the shade is suppressing that cover crop and keeping it from competing. So the cereal rye that we planted at 40 pound per acre rate has established and it's growing decently in the soil. We also seeded two pounds of winter camelina. However, I don't see any indication that it's established. You can learn more about interseeding corn and also interseeding soybean at an upcoming field day on August 15th. You can look for that information and the agenda online at ndsu.edu slash soil health. This project is being led by Maricel Birdie, a professor of crop and forage production. Coming up on Ag Week TV, the world famous Budweiser Clydesdales will meet them and the team that handles them. WDAY 970 AM has added the Red River Farm Network to its lineup. Join the Red River Farm Network team as we partner with Ag Week to cover the area's number one industry, agriculture. Join us Monday through Friday for Country Morning at 7 AM, opening markets at 8.30, market updates at 9.30, 10.30, and 11.30, closing markets at 1.30. We're committed to reporting agriculture's business on the Red River Farm Network, Ag Week, and WDAY 970 AM. The North Dakota Soybean Council invests checkoff dollars to increase soybean demand, increase yields, and open new markets. The soybean checkoff has resulted in stronger prices and higher yielding varieties. Checkoff dollars fund research to bring solutions to farmers' greatest production challenges. Global demand for North Dakota soybeans for human consumption, animal feed, and commercial use has never been greater. Checkoff dollars, investing in a profitable future for North Dakota soybean farmers. Every year, 40% of all food in the U.S. never gets eaten. 40%. That's almost half the food we produce. Food waste is a serious problem. It impacts all of us. And it's expensive. Your family is throwing $1,500 a year in the trash. We're working hard to put food waste on the chopping block. And you can do the same at home. Learn how to cook it, store it, and share it. Just don't waste it. Go to savethefood.com. I'm Jenny Garth, and as a mother of three, I know kids worry about a lot of things. Getting enough food to eat shouldn't be one of them. But here in America, that is a real worry for one in five children. Even though we are one of the most food-rich countries in the world, 15 million children don't know where their next meal is coming from. This is unacceptable, and something the Feeding America nationwide network of food banks is working to solve. Instead of accepting that our country lets billions of pounds of surplus food go to waste every year, 
Feeding America has made it their mission to help families in need by rescuing this food. Through food pantries and meal programs, the nationwide network of food banks provides more than 3 billion meals, serving virtually every community in the United States, including yours. Join me in supporting Feeding America and your local food bank by visiting feedingamerica.org. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America. Egg Week TV, presented by Kaler Farms. You know Dasher and Dancer and Prancer and Vixen, but how about Rock, King, Cash, and Sparky? If you've watched the Super Bowl, you've seen them, the iconic Budweiser Clydesdales. The horses came to Moorhead for an event put on by Anheuser-Busch. Taking care of the gentle giants is quite a task. When the world-famous Budweiser Clydesdales come to town, people come out in droves to see the iconic mascots. It's pretty cool. The Clydesdales have been tied to Budweiser for decades. They date back to 1933. August Bush Jr. presented a team of Clydesdales to his father, August Bush Sr., to celebrate the repeal of Prohibition. And so they've been part of the brand ever since. Still, the majestic horses are paraded around the nation to special events. Got your special case of beer for you here. Budweiser has three traveling teams, one on each coast and one in Missouri. In order to be a Budweiser Clydesdale, they have to have this iconic white stripe right here in their face, the four white socks, they have a black man and tail, kind of bay in color. And so just the perfect mark ones get to come on the road and travel with us. And they must be a gelding. Each team has 10 horses, eight for the wagon with two spares and a Dalmatian. He used to ride on the wagon and guard the wagon and the horses while the driver would make the delivery back in the day. Before these big guys are ready for showtime, the crew of seven spends about five hours clipping, trimming, bathing and shining. So usually uh, two people work on a horse at a time. One does his head ears, uh, his upper body, and then the other person will do uh, the uh, remainder of his body. They're on the road 300 days a year. This is Donnie. He's actually one of our largest horses. He weighs about 2,000 pounds and is about 19 hands. And a hand is four inches and is measured right here by his withers. But he can put his head up up to about 10 feet. Each handler is expertly trained in driving the team also. Four reins in each hand. The lines can weigh up to about 75 pounds. Each horse plays an important role in front of the wagon. Donnie, he's one of our wheel horses, and so he is closest to the wagon because he's one of the biggest ones. Our wagon weighs about 8,000 pounds, so we want the strongest horses toward the back. The smallest and the most agile horses lead the cart. Overall, it creates a stunning sight perhaps a perfect symbol for the Budweiser company. Each horse eats 12 to 15 pounds of grain and 40 to 50 pounds of hay per day, along with nearly 50 gallons of water. Thanks for watching this week's edition of Ag Week TV. Remember, for all your ag news, go to agweek.com. We'll see you next week.